very pleased to have all of you. What I hold in my hand is actually the, uh, the, 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 the new book, uh, Death of a Despair, uh, uh, Despair uh, and also The Future of a Capitalism, a book co-authored by Professor Anne Case and Professor Anne Steaton, published last year. So this is really a very interesting book. I was really struck by the, uh, the, the book that uh, uh, you mentioned uh, in, the, in the book, Life Expectancy has, uh, across the world has been constantly rising for almost a century, but uh, actually uh, uh, it's become a hallmark actually for the highly developed nations. But, but the income, here comes the strange trend that uh, it's also coming down. Yeah, you know, when, when we first started this work, which was what, in the summer of 2014, so seven years ago now, we noticed this um, reversal where mortality in midlife, um, you know, people in their 40s and 50s, which had been declining for more than a century, a bit rocky sometimes, but a pretty steady decline, had started turning around. So, you know, and, and instead of continuing to go down from the mid 90s until when we were writing, had started to rise. And so this is something you really don't expect to see at all. We didn't know at the time that overall life expectancy was falling. But what was happening was only happening in the US. So when we compared what was happening in the US to other wealthy countries, other English speaking countries, their mortality rates continued to fall. So progress was continuing elsewhere, but in the US, in one particular group among whites, which are the most privileged group in the US, mortality rates had started to rise. And this came as a surprise to us. And it came as a surprise to all of the other people that we showed this to. We thought everyone must know this who works in this area, but it was a shock. So that was the beginning. And we started to dig to try to find out what is going on here? Why did progress stop? Not just for a year, but over over two decades. Yeah, no, I, this is a fascinating book. I think that uh, you have done a very uh, substantial analysis and always all the, all the, all the data and, and, and discovery, actually. I mean, you, you were basically, uh, it's uh, the life expectancy in the world's countries in the world is uh, fell for the first time in decade. And uh, Life expectancy uh, in the U.S. fell again in 2016, and for the third time in a row in 2017. Uh, you know, I mean, now we're also <laughs> hit by this pandemic uh, going on around the world. So I think the U.S., of course, is one of the you know wealthiest countries uh, achieved a, a high expectant life expectancy, uh, but lessons for for other countries to learn for China and for for the world. So what what we can learn from that because China is actually getting a bit high life expectancy now and uh, uh, we just as a population uh, census uh, <laughs> report released about two days ago and uh, China is, is having an a, a improved life expectancy but we should be of care for, uh, of, uh, to learn the lessons uh, for, for the, for, from other countries as well. Maybe you could uh, share some light on that as well. Well, I think the... Um... You know, we, this is not a very helpful thing, but one of the things to say is, is to make sure that what happened, some of the things that happened in the United States um, did, did do not happen um, elsewhere. So that's one of the lessons. It doesn't tell you in detail. I mean, I've talked about this in China before, but, you know, we draw an analogy in the book with what happened in China in the 19th century um, when you know, opium dealers um, from Britain sort of forced their way into selling opium um, to the Chinese people very much against um, local wishes. And to some extent, there's a parallel with what happened in the United States, that very powerful pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical distributors distributed enormous amounts of opiates, opioids, um, essentially, legalized heroin, um, which caused terrific trouble in the United States with many people dying. Um, so the three, three causes of death that were rising that, that caused mortality to turn the wrong way in the US were suicide, drug overdose, 
and alcoholic liver disease. So we, as a shorthand, started to call those deaths of despair. And that was really just a shorthand for those three causes of death. But in those three causes of death, what we saw was a great deal of despair, that people don't kill themselves with drugs or alcohol or a gun unless something is going very badly wrong in their lives. So we, we, in the book, what we did was first document that this was indeed happening throughout the U.S., but only for people who were not well-educated, only for people who did not have a four-year college degree. And so from there, we turned to economics to ask the question, what is it that's happened in the U.S. that has happened only to people without a four-year college degree that might be um, um, a powerful enough force that people would start killing themselves in very large numbers. So, and a very important part of that story throughout was that it wasn't happening in other rich countries around the world. Or if it was happening, and it is happening a little in Britain, um, in Canada and, and Ireland, it's not happening to anything like the same scale as is happening in the United States, which means that stories about globalization or technical change, um, which many people tend to blame, um, you can't really tell that story without saying why is globalization and technical change having such different effects in Germany and Britain than it's having in the United States. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I ask you to delve a little bit deeper into the sort of the deep causes. I was very struck by your statement a minute ago that you want other countries to be able to draw on the lessons uh, of uh, what the U.S. suffered and not, not repeat the same mistakes. I, I never thought I'd, I'd be looking back on the 1970s as possibly uh, a kind of a golden age. But no. at that time, way, real median real wages were going up, which they haven't been since 1979. Um, that, do you think, can you discuss a bit more what you think in either policy changes or environmental changes or uh, social changes that you were think were, were driving it? Was it uh, failure to enforce anti-monopoly laws, changes in the financial system? There are all sorts of hypotheses and I'd just like you to elaborate on what you think the, the major causes were. So the high water mark for blue collar wages in the US was 1972. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, uh, wages for people without a college degree have been falling for men first, for women with a lag, but they've been falling now for a couple of decades as well. They rise in booms. And you know, so it's not like it's been continuous fall. It's just that you get this ratchet effect that they rise up in the boom and then they fall and they never get back to where they were before. So, you know, in the Trump boom, which many people pushed as being, you know, the best labor market there'd been in a century, um, real wages for people without a four-year college degree were lower than at any date in the 1980s, for example. So, so part of that is certainly that uh, there was globalization, there was automation, those things were happening and certainly would have uh, made low collar, uh, blue collar workers more vulnerable. So part of it is a policy decision about whether or not the workers who were affected were going to be retrained, whether or not uh, the, the pie getting bigger through globalization was going to be distributed to everyone or was going to be just distributed among the people at the top. So part of that is policy um, in terms of uh, what was going on. But the other part that's different about the US is the way that we finance our healthcare system. And that plays an important role in the story in a way that's kind of happening behind the curtain. Because, um, because we tie uh, health insurance to employers in the U.S., which is highly unusual. Uh, if you combine that with the fact that the healthcare industry got larger and larger and more and more expensive, what that meant was that employers had to pay a larger and larger premium to hire any worker, including those blue-collar workers. So that 
came out of blue collar wages. So as healthcare went uh, from being what it was, which was not much of GDP back in, let's say 1960, to being $1.05 by the time we get to 2020, um, what that meant was that blue collar wages fell as more money was spent on their health care. Um, and also the jobs went with it. So, you know, if you're an employer and you have to pay $20,000 a year um, to hire, you know, a janitor um, or a cleaner, the, it's meant that very, very few large firms in America have any cleaning staff, the mail room is gone, the security staff, the food services workers, the drivers, um, they're all contract, not all, but nearly all are contracted out. And this is not contracted out to China or India. I mean, we're talking about contracting out to local um, firms that supply labor. And we think that in not us, but many other scholars too, have begun to think of the bachelor's degree as the ticket into a sort of protected sector. Um, and you don't face competition. But just to elaborate on something you just said, which is very important, um, our, our friend Thomas Philippon has written a book about price trends in Britain compared with price trends even in the EU. And, you know, he was someone who came from France to the U.S. as a graduate student, and he was struck with cell phones, exactly what you just said about cars. They were much better quality than they were in France, and they were much cheaper. And now, you know, in 2020, they're not as good as in France, and they're much more expensive. And that's true for a whole range of goods. And again, this is tending to feed this idea that American markets are just not as competitive as they are in Europe, uh, let alone in China. I, I think we have a very, started a very, a very good uh, topic on, on these issues. I think the uh, what is going on at uh, 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 in, in, in lessons learned from U.S., you talk about the, uh, the, all those factors, you know, education, uh, healthcare, and uh, robotics, uh, globalization. So we are actually now having this uh, pandemic, and uh, we're gonna, probably going to see the situation deteriorate further as, as time goes on at, uh, with, with all the factors multiply. And uh, so... So the question I want to raise is that the future of, a of capitalism, which is uh, the book uh, that uh, you had many interesting things, you know, education, you know, people who had a four-year education have a better uh, uh, income level, and also uh, uh, countries spending on the, on the health care, how they run the, uh, the health care system, and uh, also the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, globalization, how, how, how the jobs, technology go and play, uh, all those factors. It's really fascinating. I think that is exactly what China probably is doing as well. Uh, the latest uh, uh, population census data, 280 million people among its population have a college degree or currently in a college. So which means this is going to really help the, uh, the real future uh, of them. So that's probably one of the lessons we learned from your book as well. Second, the health. It's really striking uh, that uh, U.S. has actually spent, according to the, the number you have, it's almost... Uh, uh, a 20 percent GDP on the health uh, system, whereas China is about five or six percent. But China's already almost have uh, 1.3 billion people and some kind of medical coverage, and uh, and uh, also that uh, uh, life expectancy. China is probably only two or three years shortage of uh, of US now, and it's quickly catching up. Uh, so. And also, China was this year, you know, they, they announced that China has lifted 800 million people out of extreme poverty. And also, the Chinese family values, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a companion, the family encouragement, whereas they can avoid those kind of a, a suicide. So, so what do you think about, you know, what, what China has, has done and then what, what can be, uh, uh, you know, prevented in the future that not going to repeat some of the lessons maybe we're having, or, or maybe we're, has some... You know, how, how we can really improve that? Uh, probably you are the authorities on that. Um, so there are several things to pick up on here. I mean, it's a really fascinating set of issues. Just yes. to start with education. Um, other countries don't seem to have this strict divide between ha you have a college degree or you don't. And if you have a college degree, 
you are protected and your life is going well. Whereas if you don't have a college degree, you it's very hard to get married. Um, it's very hard to um, have a community life that's meaningful. In other countries, that doesn't, that's not happening. So it seems like that is something that's in some way special to the US. And it may be that in, in other countries, uh, there's not stigma attached to having uh, jobs that are meaningful jobs uh, that you need skills for, but you don't need a college degree for. So that's, that's one thing. I don't know if you want to... Well, uh, this education thing is, is very hard, and there's a lot of controversy about it too. But you know what you were saying about the progress that China has made in educating people. That's got to be good. You know, we believe in education. You know, we're college professors. How could we not believe in education? Both of us grew up in pretty humble backgrounds, and for us, the educational system was our escape. You know, it was what allowed us um, to move into success and you know the things we've done in our lives. So we're not going to say anything bad about education. Um, and you know, education gives people skills or allows latent skills to be expressed. And that's good for them and it's good for the country and it's good for everybody. So that's a terrific thing. But there's another role of education which seems to be as a marker of social status. Mm. And having a BA in America, it seems to increasingly have become um, what the philosopher Michael Sandel has called the, you know, key to respect, a key to uh, social esteem, the key to a good job.